What's up? Yes, he's out. The order, regular meeting of Capitol City Council, April the 11th. Roll call, please. Council Member Story. Here. Council Member Peterson. Here. Council Member Brooks. Here. Mayor Bertrand. Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Have some presentations. So I'd like to call for the police chief to introduce a new officer. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, I'm really happy, pleased to be in front of you tonight to introduce our newest police officer with the Capitola Police Department, Mike Kilroy. Mike was sworn in on March 15th after an abbreviated, abbreviated uh, post training academy. Uh, he currently is in phase training with Officer Guillermo Vasquez. Perhaps you've seen him on patrol uh, during the, uh, the mid-shift hours. Uh, Mike brings with him 20 years of previous law enforcement experience with the Phoenix Police Department, which is very beneficial for us. And so we're really happy that we're able to attract Mike and, and bring him back home. He can talk about that. Uh, Mike is married, has been married for 24 years to his wife, Lisa, who's here in the front row with their daughters, Lauren, 14 years old, and Alyssa, who's 12 years old. Also uh, in town for this uh, presentation uh, to council is Mike's father, Mike Sr. Is that appropriate? <laughs> Close enough? <laughs> uh, so I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the entire city council, of course, and the police department, uh, I'd like to formally welcome uh, Mike Kilroy uh, to the Capitola Police Department. Uh, and give him a chance to say a few things to council. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Mayor, council, uh, thank you for having me, and I appreciate the uh, time that you've uh, provided me today. Um, as Chief McManus said, I do have prior law enforcement experience in a rather large department, um, and I'd like to just say that I am overly impressed with what was sold to me as a sleepy beach town for a small department, the amount of work that the men and women here do for uh, the citizens. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing uh, the amount of depth that they are not only required to but um, excel at in getting into in investigations, um, not having specialty details like I was lucky enough to have in Phoenix where if we had a big scene, basically we hold it and allow the details to come in and investigate. So the men and women that you have here so far um, are, have been amazing. I'm, I'm extremely impressed, like I said, with their investigative and, and work ethics. And I'm just very happy to be a part of this family now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> With that, I call to the city clerk, do we have any additional material? Yes, we received one public comment for item 8B and three public comment items for 8D. Those arrived um, later today and um, are available on the dais and in the back. Any additions and deletions to the agenda? I have a deletion. I'd like to pull item B, excuse me, 8B, uh, consideration of village declaration policy to be uh, agendized at a future time. So moving along, public comments. Uh, this just point of order, don't we need to vote on um, continuing an item? I did not know. I, I do think that that's actually the best process. Okay. Um, my apologies. Um, I'd like to consider a vote on this item. Could I just Ma ask what, uh, yeah, if <laughs> the reason for continuance? Uh. Um, Ed has been leaving this effort, and he has not been able to prepare his report in conjunction with the BIA. All right. Thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, say if there are those who are in attendance, um, today we may want to give them the opportunity um, but if we're going to hold it at another date I would like um, a motion for a specific date just so that they would be informed uh, duly noted um, is there a motion to let's say what would be because I haven't talked to Ed about this all I know is that he requested to remove this w I believe we can continue it to the next meeting the next meeting is pretty full but I don't think this is too much of an item to put on there I won't be at the next meeting should we put it out two meetings? First meeting in May, May 2nd, I believe. So I move we continue this to May 2nd. Um, it's actually May 2nd. 
Ninth. Ninth, oh, excuse me, thank you. Okay, um, in terms of order, are there any public comments on this? Karen, I see you sneaking up. No, okay, no public comments. Um, all, all those in favor? Uh, can, uh, can we clarify a motion and uh, second, please? Yeah, I made the motion. I'll second. Okay, sorry. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, moving along. Now we're at a time for public comments. You get three minutes to talk. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be much shorter than that. Uh, Karen Hanna. Um, the, I'm here on behalf of the BIA at our last board of directors meeting. We uh, voted unanimously to ask Vice Mayor Kristen Peterson to be our liaison to the BIA and she has graciously accepted. So um, she'll be coming to our board meetings and uh, bringing information back or be able to ans answer questions for you and answer questions for us and we really appreciate her being able to do that. Thank you. Looking forward to it, thank you. Excellent choice. More comments, thank you. Separate topic, yeah, hi, Melinda Vento. I just wanted to thank the City Council as well as Capitol Police Department on behalf of all my neighbors on Topaz Street, the calming efforts, while there's still people that aren't maybe obeying the law and, and running the, the signs, it has been a big relief for us and I really appreciate it. I wanna thank everyone because this has been an effort that's been ongoing for a couple years. And I know that Capitol PD is, we've seen them out there uh, the last couple of weeks enforcing and it's really helped. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other comments from the public? Okay, bringing it back to city council and staff comments. I have a few. Okay, go for it. Sure. Um, so just two weeks ago, I was able to volunteer at the Live Oak um, Senior Resource Center where my four-year-old and I were able to help feed the seniors that come in from all throughout the county. I highly recommend anybody who has an hour to um, attend. It's a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday noon slot that they welcome any support um, from the community. And they're also looking for drivers uh, to deliver the food through their Meals on Wheels um, program. In addition to that, I was also able to attend the Seniors in Isolation, um, uh, what, are they, what is this called, the art show um, at the Mall Museum. And um, it was beautifully done. They're gonna have that going on for a few more months and I've brought some of their cards. Um, and then lastly, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Peterson and I were able to attend the 2020 Census uh, press release, and I know we have some people in the audience to talk a little bit more about that. So thank you. Yeah, I just have a quick comment. Uh, next Wednesday, April 17th, the Community Action Board is going to be having a public forum on their community action plan. Uh, it starts at 6.15. It's at the Community Foundation in Aptos, uh, and it's an opportunity to hear about the uh, community action plan and for the community to provide feedback on their experiences uh, with poverty and the causes of poverty in Santa Cruz County. Okay. So, um, so you went to, it's working. Oh, no, I, oh, I thought if I may, Mayor. Yeah, yeah you yeah. may. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to announce uh, that um, at the McGregor St Skate Park on May 11th on McGregor Street, the Capitola uh, Police Department is sponsoring a skate tola, um, and it's going to be uh, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon. Uh, there's going to be skating demonstrations. Uh, we're going to actually um, unveil the new mur mural that's in uh, uh, painted uh, at the park. The artists will be there as well. So I would just encourage all the residents, please come out, support the kids, support the police department, and have a good time, uh, you know, with the skating demonstrations. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, you know, we just heard um, a uh, compliment from a resident on Topaz about the actions that the city council took to restrict the traffic. And I did want to ask that uh, we have asked staff to do a follow-up evaluation um, and maybe um, bring to us their plan for evaluating uh, the, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the activities or uh, the infrastructure that we put in there um, and the turn restriction signs. 
we of course get a lot of comments, and, and they're good and bad, um, uh, but I think that we should, uh, it'd be educational for us to look at the effectiveness for what we've done, for maybe for future reference, and also whether we can take some of these positive results uh, and maybe implement them on some of the other streets, uh, you know, without, you know, impinging, because sometimes when you take, do things on one street, it just pushes the problem elsewhere. Um, so I think it would be good for us to follow up uh, uh, with what, what's going on there uh, and seeing if we can, um, uh, one, have a, a, a formal report and then see if we need to take any further uh, activities there. Mr. City Manager. Uh, Council Member Story, staff's plan at this point has been to, we were intending to begin traffic counts in May and conduct traffic counts and once we had the data, we had the before, uh, the, the installation and after the installation and come back with the report with the traffic data, the report from the police chief about how enforcement's gone. Excellent. So it probably yeah. would be some point in June. Does that meet with your council's expectations? Oh, I, I think, yeah, I think that that's a reasonable time frame to do an effective evaluation. Um, and maybe I would like to maybe just see which particular streets we're going to do the counts on, uh, just to make sure that we're comprehensive and uh, and looking at not just Topaz but the adjacent streets as well. Um, and hopefully, you know, we will uh, verify that we've had some positive results there. Thank you, thank you for that, staff. Okay, sorry, I didn't think you had a comment, but you certainly did. Um, I also went uh, with um, Meals and Wheels to some people's homes and delivered meals, and I was quite surprised I knew quite a few of the people. And, you know, I did not know that these people were getting meals uh, from Meals and Wheels, and it was quite humbling. Uh, these are people that I see all the time, someone that I've actually known for 25 years, a uh, friend of my mother's. and so. Um, these are people in your neighborhood, these are people in the community that you see and know all uh, in the course of shopping or whatever it is, and sometimes they're in need. So it's very humbling. And also in terms of uh, humbling, um, I went to um, something today that was truly remarkable, I think. And the beautiful thing about it was it was a great showing of how strong our community is, from young to old, from babies crying, from older people that, you know, were helped to get there by their caregivers. And this, to me, is a wonderful thing about this community. So be involved. Look around you. The first story, the first event that I just told you, event, excuse me, about someone that I've known for a long time. There's people in this community, reach out to them. Take your part to be a member of the community that is your community right now. It makes it stronger, it helps people in their need, and they may in turn help you. Thank you. Staff comments. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, there's two items I just wanted to bring to your attention. The first was that yesterday the Coastal Commission approved our permits for the jetty uh, and flume which really kudos to the public works team. It took a little bit of last minute negotiating based on some comments that we got from Surfrider, but we were able to get the permit, so that's a great, great achievement. Uh, secondarily, I just also wanted to let everybody know that the uh, fastest Easter egg hunt in the West will be taking place on April 20th. <laughs> uh, show up, I think it takes place between 11 and 11.01 out on the beach. Uh, so <laughs> be on time or uh, miss out. It's uh, coming up on the 20th, that's Saturday, not this Saturday, but the next. Yes, don't blink. <laughs> um, City Clerk. None, thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the consent calendar. We have a consent calendar here. Any items from the consent calendar City Council would like to pull? Any items from the consent calendar public would like to pull? Data, I'd like your motion. I'll move this consent calendar. Second, anyone? Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No, so the passes. On to items in general government public hearings. So we have uh, consider resolution supporting census 2020, complete count committee. And is there a staff report or we, we definitely have people that are gonna speak? You have a staff report, okay. 
Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'm just gonna do a very short introduction. This item is on your agenda this evening to consider approving a resolution in support of the overall complete count committee and census effort for Santa Cruz County. Uh, the city of Capitola has been participating along with help from the mayor and the complete count committee for this county. Um, and so what would be on your agenda for recommended for approval this evening is a resolution in support of the overall census efforts to make sure that everyone in the city of Capitola is counted in the upcoming 2020 census. And in addition to direct staff to appropriate $5,000 in next year's budget as our portion of the overall effort to fund uh, the census outreach efforts in the county. So with that, I will turn it over to our partnership specialist with the census, Tori Del Favro, who will give us a little bit more information. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you so much for having us on the agenda tonight. Um, I also appreciate two of your council members coming to our kickoff event um, for the County of Santa Cruz that took place um, last week on April 2nd. Um, it's critical that we have a full and accurate count, not only in Capitola, but Santa Cruz County at large. Um, as you know, we don't all just stay in um, Capitola, so we need to make sure that we actually have an accurate count um, in our city, in our county, in our state, and nationwide. There's $675 billion that are of federal funds that are appropriated based on census numbers. So we need to make sure that um, we get our fair share. Uh, just a little history, California is a giver, not a giver, getter of federal taxes. So the state of California is absolutely in the game to make sure that um, California is not undercounted. And for that to happen, we need to do things like Jacques just said, reaching out to our community members and reaching out to the hard to count populations and highlighting why it's important that they self respond to the census. The census is going to be different in 2020. They, they are gonna have self-respond available via the internet, and that's gonna open up in March of 2020. So what that means is everybody will get a mailer at home uh, highlighting to go online and fill out the census to self-respond. If that doesn't take place, there'll be some follow-up mailers and eventually a paper form will come home. But the goal is to save federal funds to have everybody self-respond from the beginning. Uh, to be brutally honest, a lot of the feedback that I'm getting in the community is um, there's some mistrust in the federal government right now. So what's gonna be required is our trusted messengers in the community go out and touch those people and talk to them and tell them why the census is important and why they should um, talk to their neighbors, talk to fellow parents at their schools to make sure that um, the census efforts are taking place um, and people are aware of what it means to them, whether it means free and reduced lunches in their kids' school or whether it means fixing potholes um, you know, up on Summit Road. There's lots of opportunities to figure out ways that federal funding affects everyone in the community. So along those lines, I really appreciate you guys having this on the agenda tonight. Um, the Santa, Santa Cruz County has been working really hard with the Community Action Board to set up a plan, a strategic plan for a full and accurate count in the county. Um, and additionally, I found out that we have a little census celebrity in town that <laughs> lives here in Capitola. And so since we had this meeting tonight, I thought, of course I'm gonna invite our in-town census celebrity. Um, this gentleman was in charge of the 1980 decennial census. He's been appointed by two different presidents to the Census Bureau, which is, I think, the, the only person to actually do that in the history of the Census Bureau, and even by two different parties, which is very exciting in our current climate. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Vince Baraba, and hopefully he can um, go deeper on the census because he's a year or two older than me, and uh, he might have some uh, good information to share with you guys. Thank you. Welcome, Vince. Thank you. Well, if I'm only a year or two older, you're really holding your age quite well. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, the, what's going on in society today in our government is causes real problems for an agency like the United States Census Bureau, which relies on the trust of the American people. It is the largest activity that ever takes place in this country, and it takes place every 10 years. And it does so because it's part of the Constitution. <coughs> That's how we allocate the Congress of the United States. This year, it got even a little more difficult because the administration decided they wanted to add a citizenship question uh, to the uh, question questionnaire. Uh, everybody I know who knows anything about taking the census uh, thinks that's a bad idea. 
In fact, the five of the former directors of the Census Bureau provided an amicus brief to the Supreme Court ruling. It was going to rule on it in uh, April 23rd, I believe. Now, I strongly believe that question will not be included because the case against it is really quite strong. Three, three federal court judges have said it's quite strong and have ruled against it, so the Supreme Court would have to ignore all three of those judges. Now, if for some reason it stays in, uh, there's a point I want to make in how we deliver a message. Census information is protected by Title 13 of the United States Code. And that title says that if anybody releases information about an individual to someone other than that individual, they are subject to severe penalties, sometimes including jail time. And the Census Bureau has a historical record of never having released information about an individual because of Title 13 of the U.S. Code and because they know that if it ever happened, the ability to collect information would be severely uh, hampered. So I think the message that I have for us here and throughout the state of California, is one of the motivations for adding the citizenship question is some states, including I think it was uh, the, uh, the conservative Nebraska senator, is trying to get legislation passed in his state that if they do ask the citizenship question, when they do districting within the state, that they will do it only with citizens. Now, I don't think we'll have that problem in the state of California, <laughs> uh, given our legislature and its position. But we're going to have to make it clear to the population, if that does happen, that they will not be affected individually. And given the basic structure of our legislature, they're not likely to be affected legislatively either. Uh, so it, from, from the position of the state of California, it'd be good that the question wasn't asked, but if it was asked, it shouldn't have a negative effect on how things are implemented in the state. And I think the key message I want to deliver is we really need to put together a, a communications pl program to people who might feel they could be subjected to some harm if they identified on the census their inf individual information is protected by law. And it's a law that's been on the record for a long time and it's never been violated. So it's important, I think, in the discussions that you have with the community, and particularly a community like ours, that we get that message across quite strongly. And I don't know how much time I got, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. The, the timer was not even turned on. <laughs> <laughs> so this is pretty important. So any questions of... Uh, two individuals that have spoken, or Vince, maybe? Well, if I may, I, what more can we as a city do to help? Uh, I know we've had the public event and you doing your presentation, but beyond that, um, are there other things that the city can do to get the message out, to let people know how important it is and how protected and privileged the information is? But you have the ability to communicate directly. You have mechanisms in place to get a message to every citizen who is registered within the city. So I would recommend that you, you, you come up with a message, and I'm sure that Tori could help you put that together, <laughs> that would go out and would, with your recommendation and let people know that how important it is uh, that you be counted. Tori? Um, I, I'm just going to add in, um, I know that everybody on the council, you know, you guys have a lot of you have a lot of layers in the community, so and as do people that are listening to this council, uh, this council meeting, and you know, reading communication from the city. So sometimes it really just takes a first pe person message. So if anybody you know can think of a group that it would be advantageous to talk to, you know, we're kind of starting um, on the macro level and hopefully really get down to the granular level um, come census day and really be working with like you know, for example, the English Learners Advisory Council at the elementary schools. So, but beyond that, like, invite us to stuff. I'd be happy to come speak at anything. Um, you know, I'm sure that I could maybe get Vince to come to with me to uh, one or two things. Um, but we would love to be out in the community and make sure that our messaging is heard and, you know, touching those people that touch the next person. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I would just like to add that I would encourage 
Tori, uh, you and if Vince would come back in as we get closer to the actual March 2020 date, um, just to keep it fresh um, as much as we can. Yeah, thank you. It's, not, it's only a couple block walk for me, so okay, that not too far. <laughs> I don't have any questions. Um, I, I do want to thank you for being here and, and sharing that information. Um, I've heard a lot about it through um, my work with CAB, and one of the things I found was really important was that every person is counted equals about two thousand dollars in funding, yep. um, and I think that that's a really important number to keep in keep in mind. Is just just submitting your one census answer is an additional two thousand dollars in funding for your community, and I think that's really important. So thank and you I both. I would only add one other thing, and I, I meant to mention it earlier. I served on the redist on the uh, redistricting commission for the state of California this year, for last last ten years, I guess, and uh, and we had access to all the information that we needed. Now, one of the reasons they wanted to add the citizenship question is they claimed that they needed that information for making sure the Voting Rights Act was uh, properly uh, deployed in the redistricting. I can tell you that we use what they call the American Community Survey to identify the information we needed to demonstrate that the districts we created met the requirements of the Voting Rights Act and they were approved by the Attorney General. So this argument that you need cis the citizenship data to demonstrate that it's, it's required for the Voting Rights Act is it's a, wrong, it's a bad story and uh, it, it's just absolutely not needed. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a recommended action. Is there any discussion, a motion in this regard? Well, I'm happy to make a motion that we approve staff recommendation on this item, um, but I wonder if there was, if you want to ask for any other public input. Okay. Thank you very much for prompting me. Um, is there anyone from the audience who would like to make some comments about this item on the agenda? Seeing none, let's bring it back to council for a motion. I'll s yeah. I made the motion. Okay. I'll second. second it. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 And so it passes. So let's move on to item C. Introduce an ordinance amending chapter nine of the Capital Municipal Code pertaining to cannabis. Is there a staff report on this? Welcome, Captain. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff. Um, I'm here this evening to propose an ordinance to amend Chapter 9.61 regarding cannabis sales, processing, and, and cultivation. My proposal this evening is to remove the prohibition on retail sales and update some language in the ordinance. As a result of the November 2018 <coughs> general election, Capitol residents passed Measure I authorizing a retail tax on cannabis sales. The, the, ca the, <coughs> the city's original prohibition on commercial cannabis is established in section 9.61. <coughs> the proposed uh, ordinance amendment uh, updates pr approved chapters 5.36 regarding uh, retail cannabis licensing and also section 17.24.020 uh, uh, regarding zoning codes for retail uh, cannabis. This ordinance will allow for the retail cannabis businesses um, after they receive a Capitola retail cannabis permit and also a conditional use permit. In addition, this ordinance will amend the, the term marijuana to cannabis and remove some uh, reductant, uh, redundant language. And so uh, I'm open for any questions. Any questions of the captain? Sam. Yeah, uh, Captain Daly. Yeah, thanks for bringing this forth. Uh, I could never believe that we would be uh, doing such a thing in all my life. But um, <coughs> um, I guess the one question and concern I had is in reading the ordinance, do we still have a prohibition, even if it's a licensed retailer, from uh, deliveries, home deliveries of, of uh, marijuana? As far as the deliveries, uh, we, this would not be a part of a part of that. So there, there still would be. They would still be prohibited. I mean, I. So, under recent California law, the city is prohibited from not allowing. We can't stop deliveries into the city, 
Uh, I think there's still an open legal question about whether one of our own retail businesses, yeah, whether right. they could conduct delivery activity within the city. I don't think that has been established yet, but it's pretty clear that at this point we can't prohibit deliveries into the city. So this right. doesn't affect us. This is really a cleanup piece that gets rid of our blanket prohibition on all commercial cannabis and says it's a blanket prohibition except for those um, as allowed under our retail licensing ordinance. Right. And I wasn't necessarily speaking about deliveries into the inventory. I mean, it has to get into the uh, uh, outlet in some manner. But I, I was thinking um, more, would the approved retailer at some point be able to uh, offer up a home delivery service, you know, through the apps, um, you know, m my daughter or orders cookies at midnight, you know, from, uh, and I don't know where, but they arrive at the door. But, so I, I was a little concerned about whether those kinds of, of activities may follow or uh, come on the heels of approving this ordinance. So what's gonna happen here, not related to this ordinance, but under our retail licensing ordinances, we'll be identifying two potential candidates for a retail cannabis license, and then they'll be moving through the entitlement process, through the planning commission. And I think at that point, we need to ask ourselves some pretty serious questions, and we have some legal questions that we're gonna have to work through about, can the city prohibit a delivery activity to residents to take pl from taking place at one of our, at our retailers, and is it desirable? You know, is it better to say that we want deliveries to local residents from a local store, which we regulate to some degree, or we don't want to have the deliveries and we'd rather, we'd rather them come from elsewhere? And so that's something we're going to still have to work through independent of this. Okay. Could I ask maybe just for a follow-up to the council on those discussions and as that progresses? And Of course. Thank you. I see the captain coming forward. Did you have a question answer no I don't believe it's excuse me the chief excuse me okay yeah okay okay any more questions okay um, if you stay there just for a second anyone from the audience would like to uh, speak on this particular topic okay seeing none come back to the City Council thank you very much captain okay uh, we have a uh, recommended action uh, to provide some money and to also make a, a motion on this um. <sighs> is there a I'll, I'll make a motion to, make a motion. Okay. to approve the ordinance amending chapter 9 of the Capitola Municipal Code pertaining to cannabis okay motion I'll second and a second okay any more discussion no all those in favor aye aye, aye. aye. okay so passes so on to revised zone code for Coastal Commission certification, we have a staff report. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Can, yes. I hate to interrupt, but mm. Mayor, if I may, um, I would like to request that on this, um, the zoning code um, item, that uh, the parts of it that pertain to the Monarch Code be bifurcated. Um, as I have a, um, a conflict, I live within 500 uh, feet of the Monarch Code. Um, and um, so I, you know, I have a residential uh, conflicting pop property interest. So I would like to maybe ask that that portion of it be uh, split out in terms of the staff report and of course the discussion and any final approval. Um, I'll leave it at your discretion whether to do it at the beginning, uh, which I will step out and come back in or do it at the end and then I will just step out at that point. Okay, um, Katie, in terms of your uh, report, uh, what works better at the beginning or at the end? I think there's some folks from the public here to to hear that item. It's I think the second or third item in my presentation. So either way works for me. I can skip those slides. We can come to it at the end, or I can start off there. So we could go out and come back. E either one. Is yeah, at, at your discretion. I, okay. I'm I'm happy to go out now, and you could. Why don't you piece? Yeah, notify us when you get to that slide and, and council member story would be excused and then come back. Okay, that works. All yeah. right. Kay. I'd like to mention also that I will need to recuse myself from discussion five uh, based on um, 
conversation of the village hotel because I will be, or a potential uh, village hotel because I will, uh, I also live within 500 feet of that location, so I will need to recuse myself from that part of the conversation. Great. Okay. So we have two. Okay. Okay. Do, if I may, do we need to say at forefront that we need to table those items since there's, n it would be a potential vote? I think you can take action and when when we get to those items. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, potentially we only have three for any particular vote as long as we have the quorum. Okay. So, yes. Katie, thank so you. So first, I'd like to thank you. You had quite a bit of homework this past weekend and leading up to tonight. Um, over the course of since 2014, we've been working on the zoning code update, but in the this is a new year and we've got new council members and so taking a first look at this with our with the most recent updates provided from the Coastal Commission staff uh, was a big undertaking so thank you for your time put into this document and review um, up to this state they we did substantial public outreach uh, went through an issues and options period a draft code in 2016 went out and then started adoption hearings in 2017 and our Zoning code was adopted by City Council last January of 2018. Um, and since January of 2018, I've been working closely with the Coastal Commission staff. I want to make it really clear that this has not been reviewed by the Coastal Commission. It's been a staff effort at, at this point. And last November, I received the redlined edits from the Coastal Commission staff, and that's where we stand today. Can we stop um, for a second? Someone has a radio or? <laughs> okay, um, I'm sorry. So uh, at this point, th we haven't submitted to the Coastal Commission, but just at a staff level, we received all of their red lines in November. Five different staff members reviewed this um, at all different levels, so it, it is uh, pretty strongly vetted uh, through with their comments, and they wanted, they had five different staff members review this so that we wouldn't be learning anything new when we hopefully submit to the Coastal Commission. Mm. Um, so we are at the final step of Coastal Commission certification. Um, your local coastal program is your the coastal program in which the uh, Capitola adopts in s so that we can regulate the, um, oversee the regulations along our coast within the coastal zone. It takes effect within our zoning code or our part of our implementation plan. Um, our zoning map is part of our implementation plan, the zoning code, and also um, part of our land use plan is the general plan land use map. So that will be updated as well when we get this certified with the Coastal Commission. Currently, the 2018 zoning code is being applied outside the coastal zone, so in mostly in our commercial areas. Until this um, is adopted by the Coastal Commission, the, we've been applying the 1975 zoning code. So two-thirds of the city is within the coastal zone and it's still under the previous regulations. Um, when we d updated our code, we updated the entire code, so we were not uh, planning on submitting portions of the zoning code. Um, it was a full update in order to make it more user-friendly and bring, a, bring in new planning um, ideas and practices. As we've gone through this, there's been some pretty significant changes happening at the Coastal Commission level in terms of uh, sea level rise policy documents that have they've released and adopted that will have um, significant effects on how we treat um, our non-conforming structures and also our structures within geological hazard sections uh, within our geological hazards overlay. So at this point, I'm recommending, and um, the Planning Commission also is uh, recommending the City Council that we submit those separately. And it's actually partially the recommendation of the Coastal Commission staff. And working through this, they realize that their policy document is new. They've been working with the County of Santa Cruz on their geological hazards update. Um, they did not provide any edits to our geological hazards update. They sent us edits that they had provided to Marin County. And then for non-conforming, um, they didn't realize the implications of making their else their um, their updates to non-conforming how far-reaching our coastal zone is. So.
so they asked not to move forward with any of their edits for non-conforming and really as a staff as staff I think it's it, it's um, the right avenue to go down is to adopt 90% of the code all the hard work that's been put into this and give the these new rights to the property owners but hold off on geological hazards and non-conforming until um, we've had substantial public outreach and have been able to work with the Coastal Commission as and work closely with our residents on what's be, what the impacts could be. So with that, I'll jump into the topics. Um, there are eight different topics within the staff report. The first is New Brighton Beach. Um, New Brighton Beach was added within the ver visitors serving overlays. And as a city, we don't have a uh, review of how high how the development standards within New Brighton Beach for height, open space, um, different types of land uses so they had asked us to add visitors serving within for New Brighton and um, what from the Planning Commission we are recommending that this go back to general under the visitors serving so that uh, we're not we're not putting in regulations that we can't require this is similar to how schools are how we enforce schools so um, we did, in our previous zoning code, we did have requirements for visitors for uh, New Brighton, and I believe some of those have carried over into our open space regulations, so um, it caught, that was a rec recent comment that I received. So within the open space, there is a reference to campgrounds as an allowed use, and within this update, we should address that as well and take out any references to land uses. So. Any questions regarding New Brighton and removing that as a specific overlay? Okay, I'll move on. Next is the Monarch Coven. So with that, Council Member Story. <laughs> uh, Sam, you can see on the video, so when yeah, you come back. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. So the next topic is the Monarch Cove Inn. Um, I'm going to talk about the current standard under what applies today. And right now, uh, the Monarch Cove Inn is a visitor serving use or visitor serving zone. And for residential uh, on this property, residential is required um, that the use by the owners and their family members of up to one unit per parcel on the three parcels. As long as a minimum of six guest bedrooms are available for visitor serving use within the three parcels. So there are three parcels on the Monarch um, Cove site. They're, can, they're allowed to have up to three residential buildings, one on each parcel, as long, and they can utilize them as a residential use as long as there's a minimum of six guest bedrooms available for visitors serving. Um, so that's the current regulation. When we updated the code, <coughs> the, the previous zoning of visitors serving became an overlay, and that's true throughout our, the whole zoning map. Um, when the base zone became single family, the R1 zone, which is in line with the whole Depot Hill neighborhood. Um, there was one footnote on the 2018 adopted code stating that single family dwellings are required to have a conditional use permit for that site and that they have to uh, comply with the development standards for single family residential within the single family residential zoning district. When we brought this to the Coastal Commission staff, they came back with an added note saying that, okay, single family can apply to this site but it's allowed only if ancillary to a visitor accommodating use. So that means that it has to be secondary to visitor accommodating on the site. So they would still have to have some type of um, accommodations. In response to this, when we brought it to Planning Commission, the Planning Commission amended the note that single family dwellings, um, rather than saying only al allowed only if ancillary to said allowed in conjunction with visitor accommodation dating use so it doesn't have to be secondary to it can be in a in conjunction with or grant of a public public access to a viewpoint and that was added more as um, t 
to provide another option. Um, within our local coastal plan, there is a map at the, it's in exhibit B, and actually it's not, it's within the local coastal plan, one of the maps. And when discussing this property, it identifies a viewpoint from the Monarch Cove in property. So um, the amendment to add or grant a public access to a viewpoint is in line with the local coastal program. It was, um, almost it was in response to the request from the Coastal Commission saying we're willing to, you know, work with you at, with an either or. So with that, I am looking for direction on if there is support for the Planning Commission edit this evening or not. And, and I thought we'd get direction on each item separately rather than me presenting all of the items and then coming back one by one. So if you have any questions for me. Yeah, how, um, questions? I do, but go ahead. No, no. I defer to okay. Robin Lambert sure. first. Um, thank you. So, first of all, how is this? Pre you mentioned this has been an ongoing pr project since 2014. It's gone out to the public. This specifically, since this has come back from the Coastal Commission, how has this been vetted through with the Coastal Commission's recommendations? H has there been any opportunity for the community to to comment or give feedback at this point? So there was s feedback received during our issues and options. When we first went out, it was one of this site was identified as one of the sites that we talked about back in 2014, 2015. Um, and it was decided at that point that we would move forward with the R1 with the visitor serving overlay. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you can have a single family use with all the other uses incorporated for visitors serving. Um, so we went with that direction and then um, it, it was reviewed, the public could speak on it during all of our public hearings. There were definitely um, specific meetings in which we sent out postcards um, letting the neighbors know when the zoning map was being changed and it was specific uh, to, this, to this site. And then um, after we received the Coastal Commission edits and brought them to Planning Commission and Planning Commission modified the red lines, we, I sent out a notice again for this meeting to all the residents within Depot Hill. Actually, I should give Linda credit for <laughs> making that happen. But so all the, re at this point, th the residents have been notified multiple times about this change. And then I think also to be clear, staff's proposal is that once the council is comfortable with the changes that we would put it out again for public comment and then go through a public comment period and then bring it back to the council and decide <laughs> on what we actually submit to the Coastal Commission. So we've been through a deep process and we still have process in front of us. Okay, we'll get to the public in a minute. Uh, Kristen? You know, I am I have some concerns about this particular issue because we've received about five um, emails or letters in public comment in the last 24 hours and I'm still trying to piece together what those how those comments fit into what we are trying to do here. And so I have some concern with really giving any uh, direction or putting this out to the public yet when personally, I can only speak for myself, but when I personally am still trying to take what we've received in the last 24 hours and match it up with the, you know these all of these updates, but specifically with this issue. Um, so I, personally have a little bit of concern in, pr in providing any direction on this particular issue moving forward um, when there's still a lot of questions and clearly a lot of concerns from the letters that we've received just in the last 24 hours. That's where I stand on this right now. Um, I personally agree with Kristen. Um, I'm going to be touring this next week with um, a neighbor and I'm hopefully going to reach out to other neighbors uh, to get a personal idea of what people in the area feel. Um, I know that a lot of the neighbors from what I remember of the earlier hearings would like to see this as R1. Uh, that's my sense, but uh, I'd like to revisit that and get a more in-depth feeling yeah. from the neighbors yeah. itself. Do you want to ask if Ellen wanted to comment? Yes, I'm just giving my comments. And so, in a sense, I'd like to put this out before there's more input and then make that decision. And at this point, I'd like to have people from the audience to have their say. 
So I'd open it up to the people in the audience on this particular question. Uh, please come forward and identify yourself if you'd like for the record. Um, I'm Lana Blodgett, and this is my husband, Robert. Good evening. And maybe we should call you Bob, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. And we are the owners of Monarch Cove Inn. And we are here this evening to give you a much clearer picture of what this is about and what we've gone through since the Coastal Commission decided that our property that has been in Bob's family for 58 years was deemed visitor serving only. We could no longer have the right to use our property as a residence as it had been. And it was devastating to both us, our children, our grandchildren, because that wasn't in our plan. And so I wrote you a letter today. I don't know if you had received it, <laughs> but if you wouldn't mind, because I'm not a good public speaker, I would like to go through this with you so that you have a better understanding of who we are and what we're asking for. Please do. My husband was 18 years old when his family purchased the El Salto property in Capitola. That property became a long lasting and beloved home for himself and our family. It has been in that family for 58 years. We're getting older. It has much history from before that time and much history since then. It has experienced many changes and downsizing, including use. Historically, the R1 visitor serving zoning, this was in place until 2005, when the California Coastal Commission decided that this long standing zoning needed to be changed on the Monarch Cove Inn. The half of the property to our half to visitor serving without an R1 zoning choice. This action eliminated access to our historical use of private residence that we'd previously enjoyed for many years. It should be noted that the other half of the property, which is right next door and was part of the original El Salto's property, received the dual zoning of VS slash R1. So they gave it to them and they eliminated us. And that remains to this day. Monarch Cove Inn is a small 11 room inn that is located at the very end of a residential neighborhood. It makes it very difficult for us, because we have neighbors that care about where they live, to do any kind of business, to grow, to do anything. Its primary source of income is that of a bed and breakfast. It makes very little money in comparison to larger venues. And the upkeep on this older, large property requires continual care and maintenance. It is truly a labor of love that we continually self-fund. My husband and I are both in our 70s and not always in the best of health. We intend to retire shortly with no plans to keep the end open as a business, a business that is not self-supporting and difficult to maintain. The city of Capitola and our neighbors on Depot Hill support this change back to VS slash R1 with the new zoning. Historically, our neighbors have expressed that they will not support any kind of expansion or growth at Monarch Cove as it impedes their privilege 
of residential use. It's a neighborhood. It's not a commercial zone. Our streets are narrow. They do not support additional traffic. And the neighbors all agree that it is a quiet, serene place and will be disturbed by additional traffic flow to any Monarch Cove Inn future visitor serving developments. We have our hands tied. We can't do anything. We are approaching the end of our lives and wish to put this zoning issue back in order for ourselves and for our children. We don't want to leave them with any underdeveloped property that is zoned solely visitor serving that isn't self-supporting and one that they cannot use as a residence to live on. We ask your support of returning our privilege to live in the house and on the property we've owned for 58 years. Give us back this opportunity to live in our family home that we love here in Capitola and then provide our children with the same privilege, which is every parent's wish. We would like to ask the Coastal Commission one question. What is the reasoning by the decision to implement a zoning amendment which is unclear, ambiguous with regards to visitor serving use? It clearly should be simplified by reverting back to a simple VS slash R1 zoning. Residential use should not be made ancillary to a private property to visitor serving use. The Coastal Commission states that it doesn't support taking the option of visitor serving away from the public and thus access to the coast, including the view of the ocean. As we all know, there are multiple areas of Capitola that have public viewpoints, but they're not on private property, including many, and I mean many, along Depot Hill. You can just walk down the street and you've got a beautiful ocean view. Okay, um, please wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> the public access, ad access adjacent to Monarch Cove along the abandoned Escalona slash Old Grand Avenue, that section is 50 feet wide and it ends up right at the edge of the cliff for a spectacular public ocean viewpoint. Thank you very much. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. TJ, you're next. Oh, excuse me. I thought it was TJ. Good evening. My name is Adam Samuels. I live in Depot Hill. Nice to see many of you and to see some of you for the first time. Thanks for your service. A um, couple logistics. <coughs> Thank you for the notice. <coughs> I don't think it was a required thing, but it was really great to receive. Um, to Councilwoman Peterson's comment about late responses, um, when I got the notice, I went online. It, there was a one page talking about the meeting. It referred to some notes, but they weren't available. I was able to first look at the excerpt relative to this in the agenda that came out on Monday. <coughs> so there was just a little bit of administrative stuff, I think, perhaps for that. And the more detailed report, I couldn't find until I actually asked somebody involved with the city and they pointed me out to the actual report. So I think that might be why things were backed up because we couldn't have access as the public. Um, secondly, I just, uh, thank you to the projects. I, you know, we have had a long relationship since I've been in the neighbor almost 12 years just trying to sort this out. And I really feel that, at least for myself, we've aligned in terms of what we want as a neighborhood that we now have an alignment on that residential is probably the right solution is great. And thanks to the council and the planning commissioners for really, you know, this proposal because um, I doubt that the Coastal Commission has been on the property. I doubt they've been in the neighborhood in a long time. And I would ask if we're going to submit something to these guys and if they care to make this kind of choice for the community, that they put their boots on the ground. I, I think otherwise it's really whimsical. 
you know, if you're there, it's pretty apparent what could work. And if you were to try to be respectful of the neighborhood and the community, I don't think it's an unreasonable request. Um, I, I, I defer to the wording of this because, you know, I think personally I'm, I've worked with many of you on this for a long time and I know you all are doing the best for the city and the, for the solution. Um, so I think just the last thing is thank you, you know, thanks for listening, thanks for everything you're doing to make what I think is the best possible solution long term for the neighborhood, for the community, and the city. Thanks. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, T.J. Welch, and uh, I am one of your planning commissioners, but I'm really here on behalf of uh, just uh, being a resident and having some concerns about the process. And I appreciate, uh, Kristen, that you uh, ask a little bit for more time. So I've been um, trying to get my arms around the Coastal Commission and how it's going to impact um, Capitola for some time now. And I've, I have. Uh, many, many hours, w way many hours. So there's a lot of hours involved in, and you each received a blue binder, I believe, with the, the edits, and you could probably see for yourselves, it gets pretty technical. And some of it is, uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming, especially when you have the state agency, the Coastal Commission, breathing down our necks, telling us that, you know, they will, they're editing, they're telling us about setbacks in the, jo or in the Cliffwood Heights that, you know, from a st one standpoint, you're wondering why do they even have a, a say about this when it's not really on the ocean itself. But more specifically, uh, tonight we're, we're talking about Monarch Cove, and um, I have some strong concerns about the Coastal Commission trying to uh, impose on private property this public view shed. And, and so we've had some debate about it in, on the, in the Planning Commission, and Katie represented that, that we kind of came up to an agreement of having a, a common viewpoint. But in talking with the Blodges, and by thank you uh, very much. I know they've been a little bit under the we weather, so I'm glad they came tonight. Um, there, if you look at that, right behind the yellow arcing line there of their property, there's a, a little brown area that's the road that um, is Escalona Drive to some extent. Now, I don't know. I've asked. I don't know who owns the property. I think uh, part of it may be the city's. And I think um, the Blodgetts are open to that being a viewpoint. But for the planning or the Coastal Commission to try to impose this uh, public access on private property when they want to enjoy their house, I don't think any of you, I know I wouldn't want uh, John Doe pulling up next to me in my backyard while I'm trying to enjoy the sun out, uh, laying out in the sun, and nobody would want to see that anyway. So. Um, I think we, we really need to be careful about how the Coastal Commission tries to impose these. And, and when you really look technically, I honestly don't believe they, I think it's called a taking in their, their legal terms in the process. And, and our LCP, our uh, past, uh, the current LCP that we're using, and there's wisdom in this room because I know that there's some people who are very involved in that. Uh, it's a little confusing about this little arrow view shed. And I think it's on the next slide that Katie had there that shows because if you look at the map, it shows uh, uh, where that view is. It's actually not on our view shed map. This is on the access, a coastal access map, which is a little bit confusing because there is no access to the coast there. So it's not on the view shed map. But um, if you look where that's at, it's really located more towards Sacramento Avenue because that whole area used to be part of El Salto. So um, that whole process is a little confusing. If we are gonna move forward with this at some point and have a actual viewpoint I would ask that we put it on the Escalona, end of Escalona, and, and respect the rights of the property owners to have private property. And then I'd also just hope that you give us some time to work through this. And, and many of the cities have been working on this, have been working on this for four, five, even up to 12 years. And some people never adopted an LCP just because of the conflict. So I would, I would just ask that we take our time through this process. It's not anything that has to be done today. And, um, and I know we feel like we have to <coughs> get this zoning code done and nobody would like to see that, any, well maybe Katie, any more than I do, have wor having worked on it. So I just ask that we take our time and get plenty of public comment in the process. Thank you, TJ. Welcome. Thank you. 
So I'm Mike Morrissey, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Um, uh, I sent you uh, a letter yesterday uh, that um, I think is, is really the intent was to introduce myself and my wife. We are new residents here. We bought the property at, uh, at 106 Sacramento uh, about a year and a half ago. We've been working with Katie and her team uh, to uh, effect a remodel. Uh, Coastal got involved in that process. Um, I think my, my goal tonight is to uh, really start a dialogue um, with the city uh, and uh, really share um, at a high level some of my concerns, some of our concerns about the process that is ongoing in Capitola, but generically across the entire state uh, by Coastal. Um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm very inspired by the Blodgett story. Uh, I, I have not met them yet personally, but I've certainly heard about uh, uh, some of the uh, issues. I read uh, the, um, the, um, the 348 page uh, red line that was uh, included uh, for tonight's agenda. Uh, I had legal counsel do that as well, uh, and that was some of the basis for uh, the letter that we sent yesterday. Um, we're, we're very concerned uh, with what's happening in Capitola, what's happening across the state uh, by, uh, by the coastal uh, staff in terms of them overstepping their bounds, uh, in terms of what they're legally entitled to do versus what they're actually doing. And we had some of that happen to us in terms of our, uh, our remodel planning process, in terms of what the coastal process actually is versus what they chose to do to insert themselves very early in the process. And uh, you know, when I, when I was listening to the, uh, the, the story tonight from the Blodgetts, that really rung home to me in terms of you know, what they're enabled to do per the Coastal Act uh, and what the city of Capitola is supposed to do, really has the right to do uh, based upon how that law is written. So uh, I'll, I'll echo some of the things that TJ said. I know I've only got another minute to go here, but uh, these are very complicated legal issues. Um, I was, I was um, really blown away by the depth of editing uh, that Coastal had done uh, in the draft that uh, we are talking about tonight um, and the impact on, on, on people, real people. And I think the Blodgets have a really good example where uh, their rights are being uh, severely threatened by Coastal getting involved when they shouldn't, right? Their job is to look at the, the LCP when it's done and then simply opine upon whether it conforms to the Coastal Act that was passed in 1976. That's what, that's what the law is. That's what their job is, okay? So, um, so I think there's a lot more discussion that we need to have and, and certainly we're, we're here. We're gonna uh, look forward to being long-term <laughs> residents of Capitola and I'm looking forward to engaging uh, with the staff and with the uh, city council individually and as a whole to help understand where this is going in the future. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the those attending? Okay, bring it back to City Council um, for some action discussion. I do have some questions. Okay. Um, so as you said, right now we're dealing with the Coastal Commission staff, mm -hmm. and these edits are based on that interchange with the Coastal Commission staff and how city planning has responded to those. Okay. So maybe, Reed, this is an issue for you also. We're trying to work with the Coastal Commission and we're trying to work with something that, in a sense, we cannot put our hands completely on. It's the staff at this point. But we have to put something forward to the Coastal Commission so they could make a ruling on. What position does that put us in, in terms of how we respond to the people in this city that want to make changes? If we put something in that is going to hold them back or allow them to go forward, what kind of position does that put us in and what kind of position does that put in property owners, for instance? Uh, thank you, Mayor Bertrand. It's a bit of a broad question, but I'll try and start wide and end up on more of a narrow point. Thank you. Because our concerns are basically the citizens of Capitola Correct. and, this, and Correct. the position of the city here in this regard. So the, you know, there is certainly uh, a difference between the Coastal Commission and the Coastal staff. And staff are the 
for similar to how the city of Capitola operates, they're the day-to-day -day implementers for the, the will of the Coastal Commission or the will of city council. Staff ought to be working uh, within the confines and the directions of whoever the governing body is. So in this instance, Katie's been working very diligently um, to facilitate discussions and work with coastal staff to develop what are ultimately supposed to be modifications or edits that would ring true at the Coastal Commission level. Um, certainly property owners have routinely disagreed with staff's perspective on what it's entitled to add or subtract from code in, in many locations up and down the state. It's not an uncommon experience by any stretch of the imagination. With respect to where that places the city, um, it's a difficult position to be in. The city needs to present something that it believes or the, the best practice would be to present something that will likely uh, be adopted or be certified by the Coastal Commission. In terms of representing your constituents, I think you do have an obligation, as you've noted, to represent the citizen, citizens of Capitola, maybe not um, anybody else. So to the extent that there are red line edits that are proposed by the Coastal Commission that you may disagree with, um, and you find there being a more compelling argument um, and be more protective of your own citizens' interests to do something different, you can certainly put that forward. You can direct Katie on the items that you find to be high profile or, or highly concerning, um, and you can you know, look at lower level issues uh, with, with maybe less of a scrutiny. But ultimately, if you identify something like this as a, as a sensitive topic for you and give Katie direction, she can spearhead an effort with their staff to maybe come to a resolution that doesn't result at loggerheads between members of the public and you know, members of this governing body with the Coastal Commission or with the Coastal staff. So you have the right to present to the Coastal Commission almost anything you please. Pragmatically, working with Coastal staff is how you get to a product that's likely to be adopted or certified by the Coastal Commission, and that's a delicate dance that involves relationship management and pragmatic give and take um, certainly, everyone has boundaries to what they're legally permitted to do or ask for, and if they exceed those boundaries, it's absolutely within uh, the discretion of the city to, to say no. Uh, but ultimately, that's coming from uh, a perspective of counsel. What is the line that you're not willing to cross? What are some things that uh, you find intolerable as a pot you know, potential overreach? So if, uh, if we're going to come back and have further discussions on this, one of the things I can do is work with Katie with, with uh, of course, council direction. If you identify areas where you find concerning or uh, specifically sensitive topics, we can approach those together um, and come out with maybe a different type of language that is both protective of private property rights, which is something that you're expressing an interest in preserving, as well as giving Coastal Commission and the Coastal uh, staff um, an opportunity to provide necessary comments that would uh, carry forward the policies of the Coastal Act. Okay. I, I would like to have that kind of exchange with the Coastal Commission staff, crystallize the issues that we have here in terms of property rights and as expressed by the Blodgetts that they would like to um, move away from providing a visitors serving uh, bed and breakfast because this is no longer feasible for them. I, I am compelled by that personally. Um, but I don't want to get at loggerheads with the Coastal Commission, which has many deeper pockets than we do. So if we could crystallize something that is compelling in terms of the individuals here that we're talking about, and I know the city planning came up with the option of a viewer's uh, location, I want to know if that is something that's actually feasible. Um, some of the letters suggest this is sort of walking away from our duties, and so that's the other side of the issue. You know, are we actually rescinding um, our position to protect the public's options? Katie, please. And if I may, um, during the first Planning Commission special hearing on this, we had Kevin Kahn from the Coastal Commission staff at our meeting, and in response to many of the, when we were working through edits and the Planning Commission would ask, would you accept this edit? He, every time that question was asked, he would say, well, I'm not the board that would, rev you know, <coughs> make the final decision on this, so I don't have an answer for you. So as much as, you know, we could definitely take another 
run through with their staff, but at some point you can also say, we don't want to accept this red line, and we could submit to the Coastal Commission without the red line, leave it as it was adopted, and see if the Coastal Commission itself has the same concerns as the staff. If okay. So, so just to say there are... How long does that process take? Because there are property owners involved here, and they may be wanting to make decisions. Or is that an unknown? So um, the process can vary. They can ask for additional time. But um, from the time they receive the LCP amendment, I don't want to misspeak. I believe it's nine months. Uh, I mean, three months. Do you? Well, oh, sorry, I'm unprepared for it. Right. As it was uh, nine years ago, I think the last time I submitted an LCP amendment as a community development director, it was three months that they had to process it, and then they could ask for a one year extension. And with something like this, historically, depending on the workload in the Santa Cruz office, I would anticipate that they would usually get it in front of their commission <coughs> nine months, a year after submission. I have one other question. Um, what precedent is the Coastal Commission staff operating under? I mean, are these individual opinions or is there enough precedent? There must have been other instances across the state of California that have come up in regards to something similar. So I'm wondering, are there precedents, things that they should be operating under? They have staff that's been there for a long period of time, such as Susan Craig and Dan. So I, I believe they're working off of a lot of precedents as okay. well as um, that. There's a continuity. I would also note of note, sort of of interest directly related to this side is that the city's original submission in its 1990 LCP, was that our last LCP? Um, I think it was about 1990 was the last time the LCP was adopted. The language about the three, uh, you know, someone needs to li can live on one of the three <coughs> parcels as long as there are six bedrooms available, that came from the Coastal Commission. That was part of their sort of what they inserted back into our So document. this is a precedent from back then. Yeah, so in terms of precedent, w uh, the city already had a tangle, and, and there may be even people in the room who n know the story behind that, but when we look back, I remember we saw this, that this actually was a red line that came back from Coastal, uh, Coastal Commission, the Coastal mm -hmm. Commission. Okay. Um, any other comments? Yeah, I, I do. Um, so I appreciate everyone coming and speaking today. I absolutely... Um, support the the homeowners the homeowners and where they stand on this what i'm concerned about is the strategy of the overall submission of of this and that we're going to be submitting some different opinions possibly submitting some different opinions from the coastal commission versus the planning commission and so strategically what would be in our best effort or best uh what would be best for us in looking at this and submitting this overall, especially missing those two elements? And so that's kind of where I'm, I'm at, at a standstill because the Planning Commission came forward with some great recommendations. Coastal Commission has their own. You staff have their own, and I'm just, I'm just wondering about what that would look like for us overall. Well, once we actually submit to the, I think at this point you want to move forward with a recommendation that you think is best for the city, so and best for its residents. So that's not so be piecemealed. It, so it's not piecemealed, and that you know the overall document is there are two chapters that would not be submitted, but the old chapters would still be in effect. So we still would have a non-conforming chapter. We would renumber it so it fits within the document. We would still have a geological hazards chapter renumbered to fit within the document. So any anyone from the public coming in to look at our documents, it, it's going to flow. It'll be user friendly. It just won't be the updated version that we put time into for those two chapters. But otherwise, in this process for updating to get to Coastal Commission to review this, you don't need to accept all of these red lines at this point. Um, and strategically, if, if you choose, if there are some that you don't want to accept, you can leave them out and we'll be getting, red, you know, if, if they don't ex certify the document, we'll be, they'll be asking us to make modifications and you'll see it again. So there'll be another time to negotiate. So for the really hard points that you don't feel right about getting certified, you can leave those out at this juncture and if they come back and request them, we can put them in at that time. 
You, you do, however, want to submit as many that you think do work with the city because to show them that they've been heard and that um, we're our update is in line with our LCP. I just wanted to jump in just for sure. process. Um, what, what this looks like is before you, you have some red line changes. You take what you do like and what you don't like, you send it all along. It's presented ultimately by coastal staff to the Coastal Commission at a hearing kind of like this one. And the coastal staff, if they think that the red line changes were that they made were necessary and that the city didn't include them, and that the Coastal Act requires they be included, they would make that pitch to the Coastal Commission. If the Coastal Commission accepted that the coastal staff's advocacy, they may approve the zoning ordinance with certain red line changes, and only if the city then agrees to them would it become effective. So the city has an opportunity, if it disagrees with these red lines or any red lines, to go to Coastal Commission at that hearing and to advocate directly to the Coastal Commission. Now certainly Coastal Commission receives a report and a recommendation from its staff the same way that you receive recommendations from your staff and depending on how your relationships are with staff, sometimes those recommendations are easily ignored or other times it's impossible to ignore them. But ultimately if there's a, a significant point of discrepancy like this one, that discrepancy can be aired out in front of the Coastal Commission if between negotiations with coastal staff and city staff, we're not able to reach uh, a resolution that's satisfactory to the council members, to the public, et cetera. But ultimately, if, if you feel that red lines are proposed that are you know, not appropriate because they trample on your citizens' rights, as, as we've heard them characterize, then you could say, we're not gonna propose those to the Coastal Commission, and when we go up to the Coastal Commission, or when Katie goes up to the Coastal Commission, she can articulate to them why those red lines were not accepted by the city and what the concerns were and how the Coastal Act doesn't require them. Coastal staff will give their presentation and then the Coastal Commission will take a vote on it. So there's future debates to be had uh, about the content of any red lines if you don't take them today. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you for explaining the process. I have one more question to circle back to the actual topic. Um, so granted, what are you, what were the thoughts behind looking at long term um, the the long term plan for the property? So granted, if it goes back to VSR one, um, what what could that look like for that property? And have we thought about the impact to the rest of the community? And you know, and you know this is hypothetical, you know. And so those are the pieces I feel like I'm missing um, if they have or have not been addressed. So if there it was torn down and a giant house was built and a block you know all of those types of things have those have, have has that been talked about so we haven't done a an overall build out for this site to talk about what could be done but i can tell you that under the r1 district a lot lot minimum size is five thousand square feet so a substantial substantially if they decided to tear down all of the homes on this site it could be redeveloped and there would be a considerable amount of um, more uh, lots on the site subdivided or under the R1. So that is something to consider mm -hmm. within uh, the, the new, you know, how the new code is drafted. But that would go to planning commission for review. It would go to planning commission Pla for planning, review. excuse me, yeah, planning yeah, commission. Yeah, it would be a subdivision application. Yeah, so from my understanding, from what I just heard, even if we decided that we only wanted some of these red lines that we were going to accept, right, it, it would still go to public comment as is, correct? No, it would only go to public comment with what we had approved or it wouldn't go to public comment at all? It, so after this step, we would take all of your recommended changes and update the document and then put it out for a public review for 45 days. And then we would go back through the process of bringing your changes. We, we would notice, put out all the noticing that needs to be redone, and it will go back to the Planning Commission for final recommendation and then adoption by the City Council. Yeah, per yeah. yeah personally, I, st I still feel concerned in, in moving forward with even approving some of the red lines or, or not. I feel like that as mentioned, this gets really technical. 
Um, we've received some last minute comments, last minute letters. And of course, um, as mentioned, I, I don't have a problem with the fact they came in last minute. I have personal concerns with being able to ensure that I understand and can apply that to this in a way that allows my decision to be well informed. And so, you know, even at the risk of um, sounding ignorant, I don't feel comfortable in moving forward and providing direction or sending this out to public comment if I don't feel confident that the decision that I'm making is uh, fully informed personally and, and well constructed. Um, so I personally would prefer that this section, this discussion topic um, be continued to a, a future meeting so that there's more time to consider um, the information we've been given in the letters, the information that we've just been given from public comment. Um, and that would be that would be my preference. Is, is that to be your motion? I will motion, yeah, to, to continue this to a future meeting. Um, and I won't be at the next one, so I would prefer uh, either the first or second meeting in May. So we have a motion. Yeah, if I may add, um, out of respect for everyone's time and all of the efforts that were made, I mean years, years and years have been set before me. <laughs> And as a new councilwoman coming on board to learn about this, um, I've spent many hours, lots of notes, lots of <laughs> questions, and I want to be respectful of of those that are are those who are emailing, those who are asking me questions, and to make an educated decision in front uh, tonight just doesn't seem um, doesn't seem right to me. Um, it has no reflection on what's being presented. It's about making, making the right, uh, the the right call on some of these red lines. And I know that our my planning commissioners knew as well, who's gone through who's gone through some of this with me. And it's just a matter of understanding um, what's in front of me. So n not even just this item. I I don't feel comfortable moving forward with with the entire um, with the entire agenda item. Okay, so the motion hasn't been seconded, um, but I would like to make a comment. Um, I, I am respectful of the fact that you are a new city council person, and I was in the same position, believe me, when other people on the city council said, hey, this woe a bit, that was appreciated. So I'm glad you said that, because it's a reality. If we're gonna be good city council people, we have to be ready to address the issue, as you put forth also. Um, I can't make a motion, but is there a second to your motion? May I ask for legal, <laughs> if, that's, if, that's, um, if that's appropriate, that we would be tabling the entire item, or are we tabling the, this particular discussion item to what, what's on the table? But, yeah, my recommendation would be to take these items one at a time. I think we have another council member who will join the conversation as we get to the other <laughs> issue areas. And, um, you know, we moved through the first issue area, I think, relatively smoothly. And so I would take action on this item would be my suggestion. Yeah, her, her motion is just on this particular item. And I totally agree that we should go item by item. Okay. But also in regards to what you said, maybe we should set a time limit. Uh, you're not going to be here at the next one. Ed will be here at the next one. Okay, so... Um, if, if you want to vote on that one, we have to wait a month, but if, if you don't, uh, we could actually, we could, we could give a certain period of time. That's what I'm sort of suggesting. Yeah, no, I, I want to be a part of the discussion in the eventual vote. I don't want to postpone it to learn more about it just to not be involved it. when it comes down to the, the final decision. Um, I definitely want to be um, involved in the final decision on it. Um, Okay. And I and I just want to backtrack just momentarily because I feel like um, council Councilwoman Brooks brought up, and I should also echo that it has nothing to do with what is presented to us. And our staff works incredibly hard on this, and so I know that it's not always easy that I'm up here saying thank you for all your hard work. We're not going to do anything with it right now. So I apologize for that, but I I do think um, I would like to be a part of that that decision in the future. So the motion hasn't been seconded. Um, I just want to ask if there could be an amendment to that. Uh, can you say we'll put this off for a month? And I'm going to propose that if there are items that we come up to that we can't make a decision tonight, we adopt the same format that during the next month we 
consider that item and have interchange with staff and interchange with the public on it so that we're better informed on making a decision on that item. Okay. And then at that point, Ed will be here. Well, Ed will be back next time. But within a month, I think that should give us enough time to, to go over these items. Yeah, would I agree. agree I, would, I would accept that uh, amendment to the motion. Okay. Would you second or do you feel not? I don't need. I, we can call the vote, yeah. If okay. I need yeah. a second. We need a oh, second. I thought you said. I'm sorry, you can't second. No, I can't second. I'll second that. You can if no one wants to. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. So there's been a motion and second. Um, and let's repeat, uh, City Clerk, please repeat the motion. The, the uh, I believe it is to do you want to do it to one month um, to yeah to the continue May the discussion of the monarch cove revisions second. to the May 9th meeting yes okay so it's been seconded motion um, all those in favor aye aye okay it passes so um, I'd like to propose uh, for the rest of the City Council that if we come up with an item that we need more time and I'm fully supportive of that, and we recognize that this is going to put staff's timetable off a little bit, but in the purposes of our duty to the city of Capitola, we have to do that. So the items that come up that we need more time on, we will take to the next, what, May 9th, right, meeting? May 9th, right? yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, please continue. Okay, so on to the next. Um, Esha topic three so and I, I just want to backtrack for a minute so there is absolutely no rush to get through the Coastal Commission edits and we can take as much time as the council needs um, I thought I would highlight in this in the staff report just the major changes that took place I'm hoping to receive comments from each of you of items that you would like me to bring back at a future meeting and I'm also available for if there are little questions that you have to reach out to me and we'll sit down and go through any technical items that just aren't clear. So no rush and this evening any items that you don't feel prepared to move forward with we can easily just continue them out to that hearing. I'm, I'm sorry to mischaracterize it sorry. but um, I have to agree every time you're available you're just wonderful so I know that this is what you're going to be doing. With Thank all five you. of us. <laughs> Thank you. So next we'll move on to ESHA. This is the environmentally sensitive hazard, um, I'm sorry, the habitat areas. areas. And we worked, the, I think the ESHA chapter has come a long way from um, the prior draft. We've gotten a little more specificity of ESHA's your environmentally sensitive habitat areas. And within the regulations, there's better standards to know when a biological study is required, where the, um, where the ESHA areas are. We, went, we hired a biologist during this process to look at our previous map. And as you can see in this map on the slide, the light green area was previously within our ESHA boundary and we've condensed it down to the dark green areas in which there's actual habitat um, and we've divided up the areas specific to the different ESHA overlays. Um, the Coastal Commission, when we brought this to them, they said, let's remove the beaches. They're not uh, sensitive habitat areas. So we'll be removing the beaches from this map. And in some of the other changes that took place under the land use plan, um, there's a standard in there that the setback from the Soquel Creek riparian corridor originally in the zoning code it was at 35 feet under the land use plan for the coastal um, the LCP it's identified at 25 feet and the Coastal Commission was supportive of moving that back down to 25 feet it seems the 35 foot will make many of the homes along the creek uh, non-conforming and by decreasing that setback there'll be there's more opportunities for more of the homes to comply with the setback requirement and as we move into non-conforming issues when you know after this step in the revision of the LCP it'll it'll be helpful to have more homes that are complying along the river um, they, we've also built in a waiver of a biological study. So typically, if, if you're within a parcel with ESHA, you're required to do a biological study. And then from the, um, the ESHA boundary of where 
the habitat area is identified, that's where your setback standard begins. And for we built in a, a waiver for those scenarios when there's definitely a development that's not going to impact the habitat area that we can waive the biological study. And previously we didn't have that. So on a home, if there was an addition off the <coughs> front that was on a parking area, we could now uh, waive that requirement. So really that's uh, within ESHA improvements. I would, however, like our city attorney to review this section and make sure that there's nothing that is outside overreaching um, by the Coastal Commission and their staff edits. So that would be my recommendation tonight, would be for the ESHA section that it be reviewed by the, uh, um, for a very close review by our legal, our city attorney. Do we need a motion on that? Uh, can I get clarification? Yeah. Does, is that recommendation, um, does that suggestion mean that you would recommend that we wait another month as we did in the last while there's review on okay so so i think if uh reed comes up with any items that should that he's concerned about we would then bring that back to the city council okay uh, okay uh, um, any comments from the public yes nels wanted to make sure that you heard from the, the city public um this is kind of a strange format for public comments tonight so I wanted to uh, my comments are actually a little more general uh, but I wanted to make them when all four council members were in the room <coughs> and I also wanted to make them sometime before 10 30 or 11 o'clock when everybody's tired and wants sorry to go home. okay uh, this is pretty uh, my name is Nels Westing this is uh, this document right here is the recently released California Coastal Commission sea level rise policy guidance Chapter 7, dated November 7, 2018. Hopefully you are all already familiar with it. Frankly, it scares the crap out of me. It contains the Coastal Commission centerpiece policy of managed retreat. Depending on how the Commission uh, implements this policy, this could have immediate and devastating impacts on residents of Capitola Village, along Sol Soquel Creek, and on Capitola's Bluffs. These impacts could include an immediate drop in property values, and lenders refusing to loan on those properties, as well as residents no longer being able to significantly improve their properties. In the longer term, the ever-present fear that the next storm, earthquake, or fire means the end of your Capitola dream and your secure financial future. And just as importantly, a major disaster could spell the end of historic and quaint Capitola that we all love. Okay, can I read the future? Do I know what the Coastal Commission is ultimately gonna do? No, of course not. And frankly, neither do you. <clears throat> but I do know, unfortunately, that disaster will strike Capitola at some point, be it a major earthquake, including a devastating village fire a la 1906, um, a log jam behind the Stockton Street Bridge diverting the creek onto Riverview Avenue and through the village, a huge Alaskan swell destroying the Esplanade businesses, and yes, even sea level rise. What, do I, what I do know is that what happens with the LCP will decide whether we can rebuild and carry on or be told to pack our bags and get the hell out. The stakes are huge and you have the responsibility to make these key decisions on behalf of all the Capitol, Capitola residents that responsibility, your responsibility, is inescapable. It is on you, so I would urge you to do two things. First, hire an attorney or a firm who is, best, is the best possible expert on dealing with the Coastal Commission and with their policy of managed retreat. And do it soon, because I am sure Coastal Committees, cities all up and down the state are scooping them up left and right. Do not, sorry to say this, do not depend on your city attorney to advise <coughs> and guide you through this minefield. They have already demonstrated their inability to successfully shepherd a process as straightforward as a neighborhood skate park. Secondly, slow down and delay the deal making with the Coastal Commission as long as you can so that the legal and political aspects of managed retreat can play out more clearly statewide do not run the risk of being an early adopter 
lest the Coastal Commission decide to make an example out of Little Capitola. Find out from an expert whether adopting the more benign sections of the LCP and then starting negotiations on the radical stuff is a smart move or a mistake. Slow down and get expert legal advice. Going up against the Coastal Commission is the classic David and Goliath story. I fear it will not work out for Capitola and its impacted residents as well as it worked out for David. Thank you. Mr. Westman, thank you for your advice. So, Karen. <laughs> this is the brother-sister act. Oh, <laughs> I did not know. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, Nelson and I both own property on the river, and I also own property in the village. So this is a really serious concern to us. And I've been involved now where I currently live on 37th with a, a, a situation with the Coastal Commission where our entire neighborhood went before the Coastal Commission to talk about a project that was, was brought um, before them. And honestly, we, we, we traveled to where the Coastal Commission was meeting. They made their staff report. Not one Coastal Commissioner even looked up from their iPads to make any kind of eye contact when, the, when citizens were making their presentation. So don't think for a second that they care about what goes on with the people who live in the area that they are overseeing. Because I don't believe that they really do. I think they, I don't know whether they rubber stamp what, what the staff says. So I just agree completely that caution is the number one here. And I, I really am heartened by the fact that I'm hearing the same thing from, from you all and, and from the staff too. So I don't, I, I feel like you're hearing us that, you know, take take the time that's necessary and um, just look at the whole thing because there's you know there's village things there's a lot of stuff that's really not really I, I don't I don't know that everybody feels really comfortable with so I hope that tonight really this my I would be the most satisfied with nothing being approved and everything being you know continued for more exploration thank you thank you again Any other comments from those attending? We can bring it back to the City Council. I think we can continue. The recommendation is to put off the ESHA until next time after we have some um, ruminations or opinions from our legal staff. Okay. Um, noted the comments from the public. I think that is something we probably should continue to think about. Um, please continue with the presentation. Do we need a motion on that? No, that, that's staff recommendation in this okay. case. That was a good question though, yes. So this next one is pretty technical and it's the village parking. We've worked hard on this in the past week and kind of come up with an idea to make this easier for the general public and I would suggest I bring this one back and, and put it actually our, I, I can go through it where we're headed but um, I can present it to you and then I think you can really dive into the details and I'll make sure to include this all in the next staff report, but this one's technical, so. You have two seconds. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do a, an overview for you. Okay, an overview is fine. Thank quick, you, Katie. I have a quick question. Yes. This is village parking. Do I need to recuse myself from you this You do one? not. I do not, okay, thank you. Just right? an overview, I mean, okay. It's the, ne the next one is the hotel. Okay. So village parking. So um, the 1975 code, uh, and it, this lines up with the uh, local coastal plan says that uh, for village parking, provided parking has to be on sites outside the village but within walking distance um, or at a remote site that's served by a shuttle system. There's exceptions included which can be approved by the Planning Commission and those are for non-historic structures and residential overlays. Um, the Capitola Theater site and the Mercantile site and the code is specific about minimizing driveway cuts, ground floor, and allowing for ground floor street frontage commercial development, and that parking areas and structures on the in should be in the interior of the site. And then it also relates to the FEMA regulations. When we went through this for the zoning code update, it's, it's pretty confusing how it's written. 
um, the non-historic structures and residential overlays um, was cut out of the update for the 2018 adopted code. So it was still to provide um, parking on sites outside of the village. The exceptions that were included were for the Capitola Theater site and the Mercantile. And again, driveway cuts should be minimized and the parking area should be located on the interior of the site. And then also the FEMA requirement. Um, when this went to the Coastal Commission, they elaborated on it quite a bit. They brought back in the non-historic structures and residential overlays. It didn't seem like it was not a focus during the conversations on that. It was just, well, it's in the LCP. We should consider why it's being removed or remedy it because there was no um, changes or backing that up. And then for the Capitola Theater site, they added a lot more regulations about limited on-site parking to serve ADA guests and valet or similar shuttle system. However, off-site parking is strongly encouraged to the maximum extent possible. And then again, talking about driveway cuts and the, the area in which the parking should occur. And then they kept the mercantile requirements and FEMA. Um, I want to call to your attention at the top of the standard, the standard is related to the location of parking. The Coastal Commission staff really took this to the next level to add a whole lot more regulations to where we were simply just trying to um, um, direct where parking should be located on a site. So taking a step back, I want to look at what the overall purpose of this is. And it's really to create great streets. And in our little village, when you're walking around and headed down to the beach, you want a safe street in which you can get to the beach or get to a restaurant. B and you don't want a street that um, you're looking both ways, looking for cars that are coming in and out of driveways. It really, when you're creating a great downtown, you typically don't have that many driveway cuts and people feel comfortable and they're enjoying the outside public realm as it's a different experience than your typical walk down the street. It's really a comforting place in which it has a lot of character and a, a sense of place. So um, this is um, just an image of a street that, you know, it doesn't have many interruptions and the pedestrians look like they feel safe. As you can see, there's some type of parade coming down the street. And we're fortunate to have this right here in our village. And some of our streets are a little bit have, uh, this is one of the strength, our strongest points is right along Capitola Avenue where there's minimal um, driveway cuts and a lot of, the, there's been alleyways you know, off of um, San Jose Avenue in the back and there's parking opportunities and redevelopment has occurred but in the appropriate places parking has been placed. So in looking at these, in, in what the purpose of this section of code is and uh, breaking it down, um, I went back to the LCP and the original regulations and it's really stating that there are certain areas, residential areas in which parking can be allowed and that would be along Cliff Avenue, um, the Riverview Avenue residential area and Cherry Avenue residential. And in those cases where there's a historic home and parking doesn't fit on the site, then it possibly may need to be placed on a, a different site. Um, requiring that that off-site space be outside the village is, I think that should be taken out of the code. This past week, the Planning Commission reviewed a project that was along Capitola Avenue that if we hadn't said that the parking had to be outside of the village, they could have placed it on another property within walking distance that was actually in the village. So, um, and the other modification in this would be to keep the mercantile and theater sites, utilize the same language that we originally had to minimize driveway cuts, make sure that the parking is central to the site and not along the street frontage. It should be placed behind the building. We have actually more um, design guidelines incorporated into the Central Village District when you read through that chapter about where the parking should be placed behind the buildings. But also um, adding a standard for properties that are fronting the commercial core. I think we should add a, a map in this section to identify where that um, commercial core is and it's shown in white on this map. Um, and stating that within the for properties fronting the commercial core, on-site parking is allowed 
If access to parking is from a side street, alleyway, or existing driveway cut, new driveway cuts are prohibited along the frontage of the commercial core. So really strengthening that language and making sure we're protecting that experience within the village. Um, and here I've just highlighted what I just went over in that. So just um, making new standards for property fronting the commercial core, also maintaining the original standards that were was in our old code for the Capitola Theater site and Mercantile, and then really specifying that in those residential overlays they may have on-site parking, and then of course the FEMA standards. And then we would keep the um, B, that the Planning Commission may permit off-site parking if the spaces are within and better defining the walkable area to a quarter mile, a quarter mile of the use in which it serves or located at a remote site served by a shuttle system. And this keeps open the availability for we have an in-lieu policy that can continue to be applied to have a remote shuttle system and all of that. So that this will be included in the next staff report so you can really look at it. If you have any immediate concerns or questions, I'm happy to answer those, but I think it'll, I'll make it easy to digest in the staff report moving forward. Any questions of staff here? Um, I had a, a question. So um, in some earlier discussions with you, the idea of parking off of alleys and, and there's been some new developments in town since I've been here anyway where uh, that's been facilitated. Um, maybe some of the um, options available to property owners would be to relax some issues in terms of separation and, and offsets from boundaries and stuff like that so that this could be augmented, that's all. I'm just thinking about it from that. In other words, come up with um, uh, planning uh, options so that owners of property would like to take advantage of the fact that we'll allow for alley parking and make that a benefit that they could get things out of that if they provide that. That's all I'm thinking. I don't know if that's a possibility, but. I'll highlight there's only uh, four lots in the village that, you know, aren't the mercantile or theater site. The four in red are, the one is the vacant lot on Capitola Avenue that a home was just approved for, so that will no longer be a vacant lot. And then the other three are uh, parking lots that could be developed in the future, one being the David Lang building. The right. corner it already has a driveway cut along the commercial core, and then the other two are accessed by side streets. So any of the existing buildings are allowed to do up to a 10% addition um, to redevelop and do a 10% addition without triggering their um, parking requirement on site. So they, there is an incentive in there to keep your um, keep current, okay. although it's minimal because of our parking issue. So this is just a dup update, so if there aren't any questions, next item. Any other questions? Yeah. You have to go. Great. I, I think if there's any feedback, I mean, this is a new idea, and I understand that we we're just hitting you with it, but if, if there's any feedback about this trajectory, uh, certainly we'd appreciate it. Otherwise, we'll just continue it along to the next meeting. Well, if I may, and before you, maybe you leave, Kristen, um, <laughs> um, I, I, just an overview about, you know, the, the process that we're going through, and we certainly shouldn't be, I think, proving anything this evening, uh, and certainly not in a piecemeal fashion, but I, I just, I, I would like for this matter to be continued um, until the May 9th meeting. Um, I would like to have... Um, uh, an analysis from staff uh, about um, one, you know, we got a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Morrissey concerning um, specific areas, citing specific regulations and where the uh, Coastal Commission staff had overstepped their authority. Um, and I would like the, a response to those um, to come back, staff's view about whether that's accurate and uh, um, and in addition, whether there were any other areas where that's a similar situation uh, so that we have some basis for determining, um, you know, where we stand in terms of coastal regulations. Um, so um, 
I would like to see that come back um, <coughs> uh, at a future meeting. Um, there's also, uh, there were red line comments concerning accessory dwelling units um, and parking related to accessory <coughs> dwelling units. And they also seem to be in conflict with um, the state regulations concerning accessory dwelling units, or I won't say in conflict, but they seem to go above <coughs> and beyond what the state was requiring. Um, and um, for example, no additional parking necessary under the state regulations is within a bus stop. There's 15 minute transit uh, times, um, whereas the Coastal Commission just struck that completely and said no additional park off street parking required if there's any transit uh, nearby. Uh, so that's an example. And so uh, I would like to have, you know, an analysis about that um, and how those two state regulations uh, uh, interplay with one another. Um, <coughs> Um, I would also, the recommendation made um, concerning looking at maybe hiring a, a, a specialist uh, 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 firm uh, to uh, help us um, you know, with this um, interaction as we move forward. I think it is going to be important for us to get good advice. Um, and I don't want to you know, discount our current city attorney, but uh, I would like to see a um, a response back about that recommendation and maybe some sense of what that would cost. Um, um, and, um, and also, I mean, just when this is structured, I mean, since we have two council members um, that have conflicts, I would like to maybe see each section maybe more focused and, and completed um, so it, it's not really bleeding in to one another. I think that we need to be very careful about whatever it is that we do um, with this uh, particular agenda item. Um, so, I mean, those were, those were my recommendations. I assume if council members have any other overarching um, direction for staff that they would like to see, um, you know, brought back, um, then I, I would, but I would like to propose that as, as a motion or uh, our direction to staff um, and a motion to continue this item until the May 9th meeting. Okay, um, she was just giving an overview, so this is not a complete uh, presentation. So I didn't think there was a motion required on this. Is that correct or not? Well, I made the motion to continue it, on, um, and I was just hoping to be able to do that while Kristen was still in the room. Um, so, but and and have this kind of overarching discussion of where we're going with this, and instead of looking at each one of these in kind of a piecemeal way. So, so are you uh, for clarification? Are you recommending that we bring back just this discussion within this agenda item, or no, are you this talking whole about the whole agenda, the whole agenda item. item? No, I I think that we need well because we haven't acted on any of it this evening. I don't know that we should um, or can. Uh, we also, Ed's not here in the room. We should do this when he's back. Um, so I think we need to take the entire agenda item. Um, I'm not hearing that there's any particular time uh, constraints in doing that in taking the time to be thoughtful about this. So the whole agenda item, have it brought back, but you know, and I have the particular questions that I posed. I would like to have staff review and, and give us you know, their analysis of it. Okay. I have another question on that. Sorry, that's just clarification. No, that's okay. Quickly. Please. Um, so I, um, I understand your concerns. Councilwoman Brooks had brought up the same possibility um, of continuing the whole item. Is there, is there a possibility, or if the council decides to continue this whole agenda item, would we go forward with the rest of the discussions just as information items, or would that end this conversation right now? I'm happy to continue. Uh, just giving you an overview because it may clarify a few things and I can quick like try to go through the slides pretty fast for you if if that's what you'd like just an overview um, any you know it you're not you don't need to take action on anything this evening so it's if, if it, and there's also quite a bit of information like accessory dwelling units we updated the whole chapter based on 
this, the new state regulations. So, um, that, but I try, so whatever you'd like to do, we can. Sure, well that's what I was asking too, because I think yeah. the information would be good to have and, and your clarification and the questions that we may have um, to ask on them, but as previously suggested by two of the council members now that perhaps the whole item should be continued. Um, okay. Was that a motion? Um, yes, you bet. Yeah, if I, if I may add, the, the way we received the information too is, was difficult to follow. So what was sent out in the agenda in correlation with this and now in correlation with that is really hard to follow tonight. Mm -hmm. And so I would second the motion um, of tabling the entire item so that we can take the time to, to, to correlate all of this and to make sure that things match up and really figure out what we're voting on overall. So I would like to second that motion. Okay. So there's been a motion and a second, so let's retract a little bit. Um, so we started this discussion with each item being brought up, and then if we decide that we needed more information, we were going to put it off to May 9th. And that was a motion and second, and we passed it. So now that Sam's come back, because he was gone at that particular time, we're basically saying, based on your motion, that you would like a complete presentation of this particular total item of the zoning code and you're concurring, you second it. So that's where we're at right now. And uh, any more discussion on that? Well, just to clarify that, I mean, I did, there were specific requests that um, I would like to have staff focus on, um, yep. and particularly looking at um, some of the issues raised in the letter from Mr. and Mrs. Um, Morrissey. Right. Um, and as well as I would like to be informed if there are other areas that the Planning Commission maybe dealt with or where um, maybe the Coastal Commission was overstepping their authority. But, you know, that could be, doesn't mean it's not good for Capitola. Some of these items may be appropriate. Uh, but uh, I think it would be good to know uh, where those areas are. Um, and, um, and, um, and also, as I said, um, in, in basically how this is how the item is structured in the future since we have two major conflicts here as well. So, mm -hmm. okay. so um, before we take a vote, I think the gist of this is we're sort of refocusing on just providing the basic information and some of the background issues with the Coastal Commission and as these issues developed in your conversation with staff and we've also been asking about legal issues too. So, um, does that sound about where we're at at this point? Is that what you would like to say? Sure. Right. And yeah. There was additional comments from council yeah, members, yeah. I understand. And well, you're responding to some of the things that was brought to the dais, and I agree with those too. So um, let's take a, a vote on this. All those in favor of Sam's motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I agree too. So we will go forward with this item from the standpoint of presenting the staff report and we'll give ourselves, I think you said to May 9th, right? So we'll be giving ourselves this next couple um, a month, excuse me, weeks to prepare this and present it, okay? So I think um, there's difficulties in understanding some of the presentation and I share some of that. And it's not because I haven't been involved in this, but we're, we're trying to pull together a lot of different pieces of information in a complicated task. And so we're going to take that time necessary to make sure that we unravel that and make it less complicated so that we could, you know, address the major issues. And um, I, th I think you're going about that, but maybe the initial effort was we we're going to approve certain things and, and then go on and maybe not approve certain things and then come back. And so we're sort of changing course there. That so makes sense. Do you want to? Yeah, it does. Do you want to receive a presentation on the remaining items yes. this evening? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But exactly. I still need to step out for. A yeah, minute. as a suggestion, <coughs> Katie, would it be possible for us to reorder and take that item last? Sure. Yeah. I don't believe anybody is. Hotel height. That's fine with you me. You may want to check in with the members of the public to see if the hotel height is an issue that the members. Ah, of the very good are. point. So. Um, hmm. <laughs> 
Hotel height. Hotel, I, I see some shaky nose, but maybe I see shaky nose. Okay. Okay, you did. <laughs> okay. No, we appreciate your comments. They're, they're very good comments. And so we're basically trying to understand this well enough. And as you said, these issues are going to have great impact going forward. And so I appreciate Sam and Yvette in particular saying that we need to time to ferret out these issues and unravel the difficulty of understanding some of the major points so we can make a good decision. Um, so let's continue on each item, but it's presentation only, and we may take this meeting, and if it gets too late, it's 9 o'clock, um, maybe we'll consider. I don't know how much more time you have. Do you have an estimate? Um, well, there were eight, eight items plus two very small ones, so probably done by 9.20, 9.30. Okay, so nine thirty. I'll go I mean as fast as I have one more quick clarifi yes. clarification question. Then, so if we're moving the one I need to recuse myself from to the very end, do I just go home? Yeah, <laughs> at that point. Yep. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. She's good on that one. Okay, <laughs> ready. Okay, okay. ADUs. So reset. Thank you. Reset. So ADUs, accessory dwelling units. When we went through the adoption process with Planning Commission and City Council, the the final draft went out in the summer of 2017 um, before the adoption hearings and the legislation that went into place at the beginning of 2018 made our new zoning code for ADUs essentially out of compliance with state law because of the changes that occurred. So actually the document that you have in front of you is in compliance with everything that came into, the, into law in 2018 and this is the first time we've been able to update it in full. So right now our standard as it is within our um, a newly adopted code is out of compliance with state law. What we did to bring it into compliance is we modified the structure. So anything that can be reviewed administratively is towards the front of the chapter and then any references for deviations to standards has to be reviewed by the Planning Commission. We brought that to the, to the end of the chapter so that within the state process, you have to have an um, administrative review process is required. And by separating the two for items like decreased setbacks, unit size, um, open space and landscaping, two-story buildings or height exceptions, those require deviations from the standards and planning commission review. So that's just been restructured. Um, quick overview of what an internal ADU is, an attached ADU and detached. An internal ADU is either within the main building or within a detached existing accessory structure. So the pool house can turn into an ADU or the detached garage. An attached ADU is simply attached to the main structure, main structure and a detached ADU is a new detached structure with an ADU in it. Why does this matter under um, the new state regulations, any single family home that's in a single family zone is allowed to have an internal ADU. So in it, prior to this change within the city of Capitola, we had minimum lot size standards. So for an attached ADU or a detached ADU, we still have a minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet. For an internal ADU in the R1 district, so your single family district, there's no longer a minimum lot size. So essentially all your homes in the R1 district um, can be a duplex essentially, but there's, there's amounts of how, how large your ADU can be, the size of the actual ADU, so it's not always an even split, but you can have two units. An internal ADU in the multifamily zone or the mixed-use neighborhood zone, we can still have a minimum lot size tied to that. So we've got that at 4,000 square feet consistent with the original 2018 approval. Uh, the next update is the new parking standard. So a question. Qu yes. Question. Um, so in terms of the internal ADU, um, my sense that you might have an external exit <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay. And it has to comply with... Setbacks uh, and stuff? 
fire setbacks. Yeah, okay. That so was not the question. setbacks of the zoning regulations, but fire. Setbacks. Oh, just fire. So yeah. So if we have a four or five foot to the, the, the boundary line, that's good enough or? So we would, any, um, any internal ADU that came in, we would have to have it reviewed by the fire department to make sure that it's in compliance with their standards. But we couldn't require our setback standards. Okay. Do, do you know what that is? That I don't know. So okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you could bring that back to us. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt, but... Um. Um, so next, the off-street parking requirements were modified. So the new parking requirements actually are uh, cut and paste from the, the new state regulations. So they have been updated. I want to draw to your attention, there's quite a few exceptions for when you need to provide off-street parking. Um, but the third one, any accessory dwelling unit that's part of the proposed or existing primary residence or an accessory structure, they do not need to bring in parking. So the only time in which you ha are required to bring in parking for your ADU now is for a new detached unit. And there's other exceptions for it if it's within a half mile of a public transit, if it's a an, in a national register district. Um, so parking's becoming not such a requirement for the new ADUs. Next, there's new uh, regulations for conversions of existing garages, carports, or covered parking. And so now, under the new regulations, you're allowed to convert your, your garage. Um, and the, you're required to provide off-street parking spaces for the existing single-family homes, so whatever the requirement would be for that existing single-family home. And the state is very specific that the required spaces may be located in any configuration on the same lot as the accessory dwelling unit, including but not limited to as covered spaces, uncovered spaces, tandem spaces, or by the use of lifts. So um, you essentially get an ADU, your car gets moved out into any place on your lot. You just have to provide that parking on the lot. Um, so and we, then we the ADU is not require covered parking any longer. So you I mean, in essence, it could all go away. In it can all go away. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then for the ADU, that space that's just been um, utilized to live in, that is not required to provide on, you're not required to provide on-site parking for the ADU space that just took over your garage. So planted it. Yeah. Um, this is one we can, so any questions with that? that yeah, I just had, and, and one clarifying, that the changes in this section concerning ADUs are all based on state law. They're not Coastal Commission red lines. That's correct. The only thing that the Coastal Commission added was um, a reference to the noticing requirement for if you need a coastal development permit. Okay. Okay. And, and our city attorney has reviewed this section and it complies with the state okay. regs. All right. Density versus floor area ratio. This we've discussed during the land use element update for the general plan. So I really don't have many slides on this, but it's just the fact that um, within the um, regional commercial zoning district and the community commercial zoning district that um, we utilize floor area as a limitation rather to, than density limits. So it was accidentally added. It's never been in the zoning code before, and it was in Table 17.24-3. And when we updated the general plan, we um, we said we'd come back and make this modification, taking out the density limits for those two zones. Any questions? No. no. That was the 20 units per acre that was added. Two questions. Um, you mentioned that the city attorney reviewed topic seven or area seven regarding the ADUs. Why not all of the documents? Um, so for the the ones that are, so throughout this process, the city attorney has reviewed different parts of the code. Um, we should, during this next um, break for this next month, 
Reed and I have talked about that he's going to do a full review of all the coastal staff edits and in the document. But we've been, um, for, for the ones that are really regulated by the state, we've been having like with the, when the wireless update came for you and this the ADU ordinance, um, we've made sure that they're in line with the state. So, but, but talking about setbacks within the R1 district, we haven't depended as heavily on our city attorney for that. I say that, that over the course of what the last five years and however many iterations there's been, the number of lawyers have taken a look at it, but <laughs> ultimately until we get to a final product that might be proposed, it's hard to do a holistic review. ADU regulations are extremely uh, tightly governed by state law and as a general law city we're subservient to that. So that was a real easy uh, item for her to pull out is just confirm this matches state regulations because we know we're going to be required to not exceed those. Um, but as we go forward, we'll definitely be taking a full review, uh, and her point is well taken. You don't need me to confirm the 12-foot setback on your side fence, but you do uh, have some double checks on things like state regulations that are very complex like ADUs, and then the broader questions about are these red lines uh, permissible, are they overreaching, those are more nuanced examinations that you don't really want to have that discussion until you have something closer to a final product because otherwise you're going to have me review a document that's going to change mm -hmm. five times. Mm -hmm. And and just in, in trying to follow along, I'm noticing there it's saying topic seven at the top and like the numbers are different than the discussion items that were. Mm -hmm. So I'm I've just again trying to follow along and I've been running into some issues of what we're talking about and where in this are reflects that and again you know so that's just a, an example of of what i've been kind of running into are these the discussion tabs that you're referring the tabs to? yes and did i six seven but discussion eight so that says topic eight but yeah, the next one will tab. say if you go again i bet it's going to say like discussion no so that one yeah topic that one matches eight. yeah so i i'm sorry that was an error in my well no, and it, it, it's it's throughout the slides oh, yeah. that and, was and yeah it's throughout the slides that i've just noticed yeah. Um, but again, just for clarification, as this comes back to us, being really specific in what, you know, what we're trying mm -hmm. to look at here, I've, that's what I've ran into. Um, and there's notes in embedded in the binder, mm -hmm. and how is that in relation to what we're, you know, the red lines that um, you're asking us to keep or not keep and so forth. So I'd like some clarification on that as well. So the notes with the hand. Yeah. yeah, so that's something that we um, incorporated to highlight those areas where the Planning Commission did not take the recommendation of the Coastal Commission. I didn't want to give you two sets of this code to show you all the red lines from the Coastal Commission that the Planning Commission reviewed. This is simply the red lines that have been accepted by the Planning Commission. So to cover our bases and make sure you're aware that they were asking for something different in those circumstances. Um, I've been working closely with Ben Noble, our contracted um, person who, who uh, has been updating and does all of the updates to the actual zoning code. And it, um, I think it would be best for prior to the May meeting if I possibly take back the binders. I can renumber things. I think it should be in order from the beginning of the document to the end. There was a lot of going back and forth with getting updated chapters from Ben, a lot of preparation that was, you know, at the, up to the final hour on this that I definitely see where the confusion lies, and I'd like to not make it confusing next time, so I'll do a better job of that. No, for thank you. Um, and the last, the last part, I don't know, are we going over part one, two, there's like these other sections in the binder, part one, two, and three, like there's different parts. Yeah. Uh, so how is that in relation to what we're discussing? So what I was, what I was highlighting in the staff report were just the really big changes that occurred from the Coastal Commission staff edits okay. and what Planning Commission changed. Okay. I'm happy to start at the beginning of this document and go part by part, if that's how the city council would like to go through this document. Um, but I, at, for this presentation, I thought I would just bring in the highlights for the city council, not knowing how in depth you wanted to get into the document. So however you, 
if, you, if you'd like, we can start at the beginning and move through, you know, with, and we, we've actually at the beginning of the Planning Commission review, not on the Coastal Commission edits, but I remember a couple years back, um, the confusion that came up with just highlighting the larger topics and the need to really touch base on each section of code. Mm -hmm. So if. Well, I'm, I'm willing to take this offline and what works best for, for my reading comfort <laughs> versus what works for everybody else. But uh, you know, ideally, it would the backup document in the agenda is what you know we're, we're what I feel should match what you know what should be given here. And so again, that's where the confusion for me. There's items one through five for discussion items in the backup document, and um, in the backup in document? the what is this called? Staff when staff the, report? the staff, staff report? report. Yeah, and so just to find that. But again, I could take this offline and talk about what would work better for me in, in okay. terms of reading this document. But thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I do have a question. Uh, probably I don't quite understand this very well. So um, going back, um, you were talking about the, um, the residential density, and this was table 17.24. You're on page 24, dash five and six, I think. And so you took away the uh, density requirement of 20 units per acre. Yes. Yep. So there's another part in the code on page 40 dash three, you're talking about permitted residential density and it's affordable housing development units are up to 20 units per acre. So it, it counts here in that case, but not in the other, so I'm trying to get an idea of the use of the, the particular zoning area. Can so it's on page 40-3, uh, section F. I was just wondering if there are two different standards, that's all. So that's in our affordable housing overlay zone? Yeah, is, so it's, it's different there, is that what you're trying to say? Affordable housing developments with up to 20 units per acre are permitted in the So the affordable eight. housing overlay zone has a density. It's a, it's a residential overlay zone. It has a density of 20 units per acre. But what we're talking about taking out the 20 units per acre is in the CC and CR districts. So it's totally different. Totally different. And that, that we would regulate density, intensity of use with the floor area ratio. Okay. That I got. But with the overlay, we're actually saying we want 20. Yeah, with, with the overlay as a residential density, that's. Okay. Got it. And we can, we're maintaining the, the residential densities in the multi-res and the single-family zones. So yeah. it's not going away from the residentially residential areas. Yeah, I remember that. That was yeah. an issue in Cliffwood Heights, and that, came, that was part of the agreement. Okay. Just want to understand that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, move on. Garage exceptions. This was a zoning code, uh, a discrepancy that one of the members of the public brought to the Planning Commission. He submitted public comment. He noted um, during the zoning code update, a new standard was added to the floor area regulations and a new exception was added for uh, lots under 3,000 square feet were allowed to have up to 250 square feet of, of garage space that wouldn't be counted towards your FAR. This went back to the issues and options. Um, we had direction from city council to build in an exception for small lots that typically wouldn't have a requirement for covered parking. Um, the gentleman that spoke on this brought up the fact that if you're anywhere between a 3,000 square foot lot to a 3,400 square foot lot, you're actually getting less development rights than a 3,000 square foot lot. So we looked at this and said, well, how can we fix the situation? It doesn't seem to be fair. So we went back to the original issues and options, fi figured out what the reason was behind this, and then found a solution. So if you're on a lot of 2,587 square feet or less, you're not required to have covered parking. We simply put together an equation that allowed the 250 square foot um, exception up for lots up to 2,587 square feet. And then we added a second equation that kind of creates a plateau so everyone gets fair, the fair um, difference between the two. 
and it creates a more of a technical <laughs> mathematic challenge under our garage exceptions, but we have updated the code to make it fair and so that larger lots are getting it, the advantage of the smaller lots. Got a question there too. Where does the 1750 come from? 1750 um, Triplet. is the floor area that can be achieved on a 2,586 square foot lot. So it's making sure that that plateau line that goes across is at 1750. Oh, on the graph. Okay, the green. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they get the difference of the two. Well, I have to admit, I'm going to think about this a little bit more. But thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, th this is just a fix. Basically, like we built in this allowance for small lots to have these cost-free garages, basically. And so suddenly, if you were one square foot over the minimum size, your house got smaller. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't really the intent. And so this is a, just sort of a fix to that to make it so that, OK, you know, if your lot happens to be 3,001 square feet, you don't get less lot than the guy that has the 2,999 square foot lot. So this is just a fix there. It was something that was identified by the Planning Commission. So the 1750 is, according to here, a garage exclusion, the area of a garage exclusion. That's what it says here. Area of garage exclusion, that's the 1750. Maximum floor area for lot size equals the garage exclusion. Oh, no, it's the minus. OK, that's yeah, your minus. equation. That's yeah. your equation. You subtract it. it. So the equation is down here in the note. OK, thank you very much. Okay. Um, also in this review, uh, there was a discussion about ancillary space. So one of the, I think one of the best changes to come about in this code is currently the way we require parking, how many parking spaces you have, we actually include the floor area of the garage in that calculation. The new zoning code does not include the floor area of the required parking space within your garage, so that 10 by 20 space. This, they also added an exception for ancillary space within a garage up to 125 square feet to not count towards your parking calculation. So if you have a garage, it has your 10 by 20 area for your parking space. And then it also has, because a parking space is required to be 10 feet by 20 feet. And it also has built in, if your garage has up to 125 feet, it can be less um, of ancillary space to say put a bicycle, surfboard, um, that a washing machine, it doesn't count towards your parking requirement. It will count towards your floor area of the overall home. Mm. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> These two are really quick additional items um, that were found that didn't carry over from the old code. And with that, I just want to say, as we review this zoning code, it's good practice in all cities to update your zoning code on an annual or every other year basis. And we're gonna continue to find these items that we did not catch. We're trying, we've made tables to make sure everything carries over from one code to the next, but there are gonna be items that come up and we'll have to continue to update. Uh, this is one of them within our um, vacation rental overlay, the enforcement um, requirements for vacation rental overlay were in a separate chapter of our transient rental overlay and they didn't get caught from that other chapter so we were now suggesting that we incorporate them this is on page 40-8 in your code um, this was not reviewed by the Planning Commission so this definitely will be highlighted when it's brought back to the Planning Commission it doesn't have their recommendation the any questions on that? This is what we can hold the Airbnbs to, to say you can't advertise um, unless it's within the vacation rental overlay. And so we'll get rid of false advertising. And um, The other one was single room occupancy. Single room occupancy didn't carry over from the old code because it was in the definitions within the parking chapter and not in the definitions section. And what it is is a dwelling unit with a kitchen facility, which is 400 square feet or less. So that now will be added to the definitions. And it's listed um, under our parking regulations as a type of use, single room occupancy. And those are the two highlighted changes that I wanted to bring to you. So with that, we can talk about the hotel height. 
and Councilmember Peterson can have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You were going to give me a ride home. I'm walking. <laughs> I'm walking. <laughs> I know. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Do you want to? Do you want to leave? Do you want to keep the binders? Yeah. Why don't I keep oh. the binder and bring it back uh, to you? I still have things I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I left I those in them. But well, I then, 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 then go ahead and keep okay. it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can take I'll send you an email when I need I'm, I'm going to at some point I'll ask for it back just so I can renumber things for you. Sure, sure. I'll just take pictures of the pages I took notes on and then give them all time back. I'll right. send you an email. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Okay. Okay, so Village Hotel and Height. Um, the Coastal Commission requested um, our original requirement for the Village Hotel Height matches what is in our general plan, and that is to increase the maximum permitted building height to provide that the maximum height of the hotel um, remains below the elevation of the bluff behind the hotel. And the Coastal Commission asked that we revise the, the language to say the maximum height of the hotel, including all rooftop architectural elements such as chimneys, cupolas, etc., and all mechanical apprentices such as elevator shafts, HVAC units, etc., remain at least 10 feet below the top elevation of the bluff behind the hotel. Um, the Planning Commission did not accept these changes. They said we want to keep as much flexibility built into the standards so that we can review the hotel at the time that it's submitted. And we don't, not knowing what will be submitted, they like the standard of just maintaining the, um, that it's below the elevation of the bluff behind the hotel. And that the second standard says the bluff behind the hotel remains visible. And it originally said from the Capitola Wharf is a green edge with existing mature trees maintained on site. The Coastal Commission asked that the bluff behind the hotel remains visible from Cliff Drive, and they also had added the beach, which we talked through, and the beach wasn't reasonable because at a lower elevation looking up, you'd never see that. And um, so here's the view of where the future hotel will be in their request for the 10 feet below the elevation of the bluff. This is, I thought we should put more specificity in the, sorry, southern, I missed the end, the southern parking lot of the of Cliff Drive, the view. And the Planning Commission's recommendation, again, was not to accept the 10 foot or all of the other the discussions on uh, the specifics of what could be within that, those 10 feet, and to add, when viewed from the southern parking lot, along the bluff of Cliff Drive. So that's where the Planning Commission recommendation ended. Any discussion? Okay. Well, thank you. That concludes my presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the City Council meeting. I move adjournment. Oh, sorry. One more I comment. Just, I just wanted. I had one follow-up question about um, the timing on the geologic hazard section and the non-conforming parcels with the Coastal Commission. Do we have a sense of when that may? Uh, that would go? be after certification of the the portion of the code that you're looking at at this point. So. And Six I think months, we, one year. Oh, I think it's several years out. I think we want to see what happens with some of the other larger jurisdictions. Okay. And you know, I think we get a little bit of guidance about where the where landing zones might be. So it's going to take a while, I think, for some of these bigger jurisdictions to work this through with the Coastal Commission. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I did have one request of Reed, but I told you personally already that I'll make it in public, and that is to um, 
do some research on the Escalona Drive. I'd like to uh, know that whole area that is um, been planned but not owned or not known who owns it or what other kind of conditions are on it. To yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so can I follow up on uh, um, Councilmember Story's question? At Planning Commission, we said we could come back as soon as the certification is done, and I think I, s I just want to echo Jamie's comments. At the direction of City Council, if you um, think it would be wise for us to wait until some of the larger jurisdictions have gone through their geological hazards mm -hmm. and they're non-conforming, I think that would be a good avenue. But as far as the conversations in front of Planning Commission have gone so far, we have committed to you know, it would be following the certification, and then, of course, we'd look to you to see when you'd like us to begin those efforts. I see. Okay. So Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much for everyone coming. Yeah, I thought yeah, it was